You cannot just go to people and tell them your diet's not healthy. You're going to have to cut out all of this stuff or whatever. Be really uh, shaming, completely disrespectful, present no viable alternatives and try and rest people from their, their ways of eating that exist within families and cultures. Eating is literally supposed to be the most fun thing we do three times a day. So why is it filled with anxiety and guilt and shame for so many of us? With me to talk about the dysfunction embedded within our food culture and how we might try and change it is Ruby Tando, author of Eat Up and Cook As You Are. Ruby, thank you so much for joining us on Downstream. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Um, I mean, this is, I guess, maybe not a nice question to start with, but one okay. of the things that struck me reading your book, Eat Up, is that anxiety has become the defining feature of our relationship with food. So why has that happened? I mean, I think that, I like that you just like gone in hard. <laughs> like, um, I think that food has always been a proxy for things much bigger than food itself. So the uh, it's kind of an entryway for us to talk about uh, religion and death and sexuality and stress and like economic systems and all of these things. So it is, is a portal to many things that are much bigger than like a chicken burger or whatever. So it makes sense to me that like here and now when things are kind of reaching reaching ahead interpersonally, culturally, economically, that food would become something that um, we are giving quite close attention and maybe attaching loads of anxiety to our diets because it's something that we can easily manage, even though obviously it's just like the tip of like this vast iceberg and so many of the things that stress us out are untouched. I mean, is... It's interesting to you talk about religion there and like in an increasingly secular, secularized world, the rules for what you eat and what you don't eat are more about optimizing something rather than, look, God says no pigs. Yeah. Um, and so do you think that we've had to find these alternatives for religion because it doesn't take up so much of our social world anymore? Yeah. I think for, I think for some people, I think, uh, I'm, I'm loath to draw like, huge sweeping uh generalizations because i think the demographics that like do this with so much vigor are quite specific um i think there is um like even okay take for example like a lot of people roughly our age will have parents or family members who were kind of big into like diets in diet culture properly like capital d capital c like all of the all of the pomp of like a proper diet that you follow from a book that so maybe you saw on a tv show and maybe you've got the matching like aerobics dvd sorry like vhs right <laughs> so like that is a, a whole clearly delineated system that tells you what to do and i think people found some comfort in that although obviously it's connected to some really fucked up stuff right but i think now it's a lot more insidious. I think people don't really like to think about diets in those times anymore. So, um, we create these really magical, um, extremely complex, extremely convoluted ways of talking about being thin or being healthy or like living long or being rich without ever having to say those things. And often that comes back to diet and it comes back to things like, Oh, I'm just like, I just. It, it just happens to be the case that I can't eat cheap white bread. So like I can only eat the expensive stuff. It's just the way my digestive system set up. You know, it's very, um, it's very loaded. I mean, I think the invisibility of the word thin in wellness culture, despite the visuals of thinness being everywhere, I think it was in Cook As You Are and I was like flipping through it and I was like a really nice recipe for a salad. And you were like, I normally don't like salads because I like hot carby food. And I was like, ah, finally someone said it. But it was just this thing of, oh, you know, I'm sure lots of people do like salads and I like them yep. a lot of the time, but so often I feel I'm pretending to like them because if I say that what I want is carbonara, yeah. that I'm undisciplined or right. too needy or weak somehow. I know. I absolutely get that. Like there's so much performance in it, right? Like everything, whenever you're in the company of people and often even when we're in our own company, 
you end up performing a little bit like what kind of a person would like a carbonara what kind of a person does that make me um with the salad thing like i don't want to be i'm sometimes sometimes tends towards being a bit of a contrarian so i don't want to like get too anti-salad because actually i often enjoy a salad but what i was trying to get at in the book was just i don't know i feel like there are um some specific factions within food writing these days that enjoy like throwing like three incredibly expensive ingredients together in a salad or like a little plate a little bowl and calling it a meal and obviously it just like wouldn't function for any normal person to get them through a working day or even a non-working day like it's just not <laughs> enough so i think i kind of just pushing back a little bit against that fussiness and preciousness um, how how did your own relationship to food evolve i mean like of course in your books you talk about first memories and stuff like that but we all have memories of food but not all of us make careers out of it I mean, I came across the other day when I was like just going through my phone, um, these pictures that I had taken of collages that I had made when I was somewhere between the ages of like maybe five and 10. I'm not sure. I'd cut out of like farm foods or Iceland catalogs. I'm not sure it was that had come through the door pictures of like King's Mill, uh, tubs of roses, but also vodka. <laughs> um, and all of these things. And I'd made collages that like kind of filled a sheet of A4 paper with those images. So like clearly there was a lot of like dwelling and ruminating <laughs> on, on food, like literally chewing over whatever food seems to me, to me in the moment. I think it's something that I've always fixated on. And obviously that can, that sometimes that goes in a healthy direction and sometimes less healthy, but it's, it's always been something I've returned to. I mean, it's that thing of like healthy way and non-healthy way. And I suppose with the stuff about optimizing what you eat, I feel like there is a soft edge of it where people say, be mindful about what you eat. But yeah. Being mindful can also mean fixated. And then yeah. if you're fixated on what you eat, it's hard to feel good eating anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think especially there's there's one principle which I think is like broadly sensible so it, you know it can have some problematic undertones and that's about like intuitive eating so it's just about kind of listening to the cues from within your own body do i feel full up do i feel hungry what do i fancy and trying not to attach too much meaning to food beyond those cues from within your own body so i broadly like that but i think a really good ex it's also a good example of how that mindfulness can be kind of wrongfully appropriated and used for nefarious ends because some people will say oh you know this is about intuitive eating because when you really listen to your body you'll find that you're not hungry at all when you really <laughs> listen to your body you'll find actually maybe it's just thirst like you don't need a mars bar you don't really want it in fact oh i've taken one bite and i'm done <laughs> right and I, I obviously there are there's always a glimmer of truth in things but like that is an example of how that kind of thinking can really be co-opted I mean, it's also incredibly gendered. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Sally Rooney novels, but in one novel, there's this woman who always forgets to eat. And she's like, oh, I've Thank just I've forgotten to eat. And Thank I was like, you. I've never forgotten to eat in my life. <laughs> <laughs> like I've like no. written down every meal I've missed. And it's like manifested in being cranky and angry and short with people. Yeah. I don't think people forget to eat. Certainly not me. Like I'm, <laughs> I, there must be people, but I, I can't relate. Yeah. And, and. I can't remember whether it's in that book or another one, but I have this kind of recollection. I might have made it up in my head of one of her characters being like, I, I found it within myself to eat like an orange and half a cup of black coffee. And I was just like, oh, come on. Like, <laughs> let's have some like some weight. Let's ha have some like heft to this food. Why is it like these tiny little discreet things? There's something for me so sad about the idea of having one orange, like something you can hold in one hand. It's not even got a plate like, <laughs> oh, yeah. But it was also the thing of like, oh, because she's not eating, she's a sensitive character. And yeah. then when you're somebody who... You know, I, I think about food all the time because I really look forward to it. And I'm always eating a meal in my head before I eat it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm not um, protagonist material. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I'm also not protagonist material because I cannot let things go unsaid. I cannot like have like subtext and romance in my life. Everything just has to come to the surface all the time, which is just like makes my whole life a stream of like messy consciousness rather than an actual <laughs> novel. So I relate to that. <laughs> You're like, I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit like that. 
Um, so your column for Vittles is called Incidental Eating. Yes. And there's a really lovely piece about shopping centre sweet corn. Yes. And I was doing some Twitter stalking and um, I think maybe there's a piece in the offing about soft serve. Yes. Um, could you describe what incidental eating is and why you're drawn to it is something to write about? Um, oh, I mean, what, what got it started? I think part of it is like as a food writer, I sometimes get approached to or like have a feeling like maybe I'll do write something about a restaurant. And then I remember that I don't know anything about restaurants. <laughs> I don't particularly enjoy like eating out in a formalized setting. I get really stressed. I get really anxious. I never know what to order. I hate the etiquette around it. And then most of the time by that point, I'm not hungry anymore anyway. So like it would be a farce for me to linger on those kinds of eating establishment as much as I respect the craft. And I was like, well, where do I eat? And the truth is like day to day, if I'm out and about, I will be eating things that I have come across in the world, stuff that has just like presented itself to me in a moment of hunger. And I'm like, that's the thing. That's what I needed. And so that's how I ended up writing about like being in a shopping center. It was one in Bradford actually with like arms full of bags. I've been to TK Maxx, which is obviously the most stressed anyone's ever going to be <laughs> like after coming out of a TK Maxx. You kind um, of feel like you got the last helicopter out of Saigon. <laughs> It's exactly like that. Like I, I was withered like mentally <laughs> and you know, you come across a sweet corn vendor and you can smell it from like halfway across the sh shopping center, which arrested me straight away. Cause it's so rare for us to smell food in the wild <laughs> these days. Like it just doesn't come to you. It's quite clinical a lot of the time and quite sterilized, but, um, that struck me as an experience and I wanted to write about more experiences like that where you just eat by accident almost. So that's why it's been sweet corn so far and seafront donuts. I love seafront donuts. And it's going to be soft serve next. You know when they turned the um, paper bag see-through? Yes. Yeah. The oil like just spreads, spreads across. That's how, why all of my notebooks now actually that I took with me to the seaside are just like raw shark tests, <laughs> just like beautiful blotches of oil all over them. Oh man, my partner insists that the best ones you can get are in Cleethorpes. I had an exceptional donut in Cleethorpes. Well, I say one, it was a bag of five, so it would have been five donuts. Was like I had five exceptional donuts yeah, in Cleethorpes. Yeah, I wonder if we went to the same place. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, I was sort of saying like, oh, you can get them anywhere. And he was like, absolutely not. Like, yeah, Cleethorpes yeah. is the mecca of the seaside donut. <laughs> um, so you were talking about the, the way in which food always embodies things which are bigger than itself. And yeah. one thing that happens is that food becomes almost a metaphor for a particular kind of person. So if mm -hmm. you want to say, oh, you're like a golf club reactionary, you're gammon. Or if yeah. you're a soft palmed, lily livered metropolitan, you're, you're <laughs> okay. always latte sipping. Okay, Despite the yeah. fact that like every Costa at a service station also sells lattes. Yeah. Um, why do we find it so easy to switch between food and people in how we like to order and process our social world? Um. I mean, I think it's just, I don't know how specific it even, obviously there is something deep about the fact that food kind of makes the person, creates the actual body physically, but I'm not even sure it's that specific about the substance of food as much as just it is a very visible behavioral thing that sets one person apart from another and it probably sets them apart from the other person three times a day at least more for some people like me so i just i think it is just very visible we always have to return to it so it gives us ample opportunities to size up other people and to try and understand like why the fuck are you doing that like who would think to do that with their food so yeah i think it it makes us curious in that way it also makes us judgmental do you think it's something about smell and taste? Is that the two of the most intimate senses that we've got? We're sort of taking a bit of something into ourselves without having sex with it. And so it affords <laughs> us sort of, you know, an opportunity to like say, ah, this is you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there is, that's a good point that there is so much a part of the reason and people who and much more articulate than me have written about this. Part of the reason there's so much etiquette around dining in particular is because it's a site where 
such vulnerable things are happening. You're having to open your mouth. You're having to like swallow things down. You're having to expose the inside of yourself. You're having to admit that you're actually quite a porous body <laughs> and that things come in and so they'll go out as well at some point. And all of these admissions are happening, but we have to enshroud them with manners, like which, which fork, which knife are you going to, um, speak with your mouth for all of this stuff? Because we have to wrap layers of nicety around a quite disgusting reality of what we're doing together at this table. I mean, you've also written that food as a code for class. And I was sort of interested, did you mean it operates as a barrier or is it like a badge of belonging or affiliation? I think it could be either. Um, I mean... I notice it a lot and depending on which contexts I move between. So like I've been up in Yorkshire for a year now and like if I'm for a while I was working in a cafe just part time. If I was there and I had a jacket potato for my lunch, I thought nothing of it, just part of life's rich tapestry. I've got my jacket potato, I feel good for the rest of the shift. When I'm down in London, if I'm if I'm hanging around with writers and and people who just in so, certain social circles, there are so many class markers attached to regardless of how the individual people in that group identify as class-wise. That's when I start feeling myself performing. I'm very guilty of it. I can be like, I'm a bit like naughty with it. Like I'll sometimes, the other day I went to 40 Maltby Street with a packet of hula hoops in my bag. I think partly as a defensive gesture <laughs> because I felt so stressed about being somewhere where, if I'm honest, I didn't know like what the wines were, what the fuck everyone was going to be eating. And I didn't trust myself to appreciate the craft of it. And so I kind of had my little safety blanket <laughs> with me just in case. But it's also a rebuke, right? Because you could bring out the hula hoops and it's the same way. I mean, um, so half my family are white and uh, there's the sort of interesting back and forth where when my mom and my stepdad first got married, it was like, well, we think you're racist and you think we're snobs and we're both right. right. Um, and food became this like battle around who got to feel comfortable in any given space. And I remember like one of my step cousins came down to London, to stay with us and like my mom made him chips to be like, you don't have to eat Bengali food. <laughs> okay. And then okay. he was like, these chips suck and it was this whole oh, no. thing but it was the way in which like him asking for the chips and then rejecting them was also like a yeah that's huge power play yeah. within the space yeah i mean that is um it's like making my breath catch in my throat like how stressful that is as a family dynamic like that kind of there are a few things you could do that would enrage i think a lot of people more than refusing food it is like such a powerful gesture Mm, I always pretend to be more religious than I am when I want to reject something. Oh, Because when I'm like, I really don't think I like this, I'll just be like, oh, I'm sorry, is that not halal? Yeah. And I'll be like, I saw you, you're drinking now. And I'm like, mm, yeah, <laughs> but the pork bit is the thing I'm really bothered about. We do this all the time, right? We, we kind of, there are parts of ourselves that we hold really tight and then there are parts of ourselves that are important to us. But if we're honest, they're more important at certain moments when they have to be. Strategically important Strategically, in some cases. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess to, to maybe open that up a bit more is, have you seen, I guess, there be a, a movement of certain foods from lowbrow back to highbrow again or, or highbrow mm. into lowbrow as it becomes more popular or, you know, the fad sort of reaches critical mass? Yeah. Um, I mean, recently, actually, I think... It was Bon Appetit did like this big series about kind of junk food, so-called, and snack foods and all of that. Um, I know that there's a book coming out soon by Laura Goodman, who's a great food writer called The Joy of Snacks. So like these kinds of foods are entering the, the, the kind of food writing spaces that actually for a long time were extremely critical and dismissive of them. But it's also... It's so fractured at the moment and I can't be bothered to get into like the Twitter, like micro level warring that is going <laughs> on about this. Like it is so like confusing, but, um, what's the warring about? I mean, if you could just sketch out the rough terrain of the battlefield. God, 
I wish if I could like scour my WhatsApp messages for everything sassy I've ever said about <laughs> it, I'd be it'd bring be it come to mind quicker. I guess the broad gist of it is that some people, and I guess I would roughly fall into this camp, feel like we need to be less judgmental of people's um people's food choices that often come from a place of whether they're culturally important, whether they're important emotionally right now, socially, whether it's a matter of like you're in somewhere where you can't, where you can only eat this food, like these things are always attached to broader webs of meaning. So some people like me feel like that. And for that reason, we want to defend junk food because it, it is the way people eat. It's just a reality. And if you really, really hate junk food, maybe you should change the systems that means that people only have that choice rather than really going in on something that actually is quite delicious to start with. So that's like one camp. And then there are some people who are like, it's rubbish, it's ultra processed. They have some very valid concerns about um, labor conditions for people in factories making these kind of foods, about uh, industrial farming, about all of these things, about the fact that some of these foods are the only option. If you live in a kind of urban food desert, so-called, that's the only thing you can eat. And so these factions have kind of split. And I think there is some cross conversation, but everyone is quite prideful about, <laughs> about who's right and who's wrong. But, um, I think there are good and bad things on both sides, but it's extremely knotted. And I think food is so emotional for people that it makes sense that it would get quite heated quite quick. I mean, it kind of reminds me of something I ate last week. So I went to a restaurant, which was, you know, a bit fancier and yeah. been really looking forward to it and hyping it and looking at the Instagram and stuff. And it had loads of foods, which I'd never heard of before and was really excited to try. Yeah. And then they had a burger, which everyone was like, this is like the best burger ever. And I was okay. like, great. So like I got the burger and I ate it and I was like, this tastes like a, a nice McDonald's burger. And then I was okay. just thinking to myself, I've just paid like 12 quid for a nice McDonald's burger. And within it is this almost like, oh, those dirty burgers are wrong and they're bad. And this is the good one. It's, it's the yeah. authentic and it's the real one. And I just thought like there is this like class war happening in my mouth right now. Yes. Um, and I don't really understand how so many menus now have these food items where if they're made and bought cheaply and they're available, they're dirty and they're bad, but then they're somehow elevated and yeah. rescued by being in this like elite space. Absolutely. I mean, I, I won't ask you to divulge it now, but I'm desperate to find out where this book <laughs> was from. But um, yeah, I mean, I've seen that happen a lot. And yeah, I mean, I, look, I don't have the, the answers to it, but it is something that I think needs more careful exploration than it is generally given, maybe. I mean, who for you in terms of food writing have has been able to sort of hold the space of thinking about the social and the economic and the cultural conditions in which food is produced, but also makes room for pleasure mm. and fun and the way in which food is the sort of social lubricant of, of social content? Um, loads of people at the moment, which is kind of why I feel, actually for the first time in a long time, I feel excited to be doing food writing because there's so much good stuff happening. So I read a book recently called Eating While Black, mm -hmm. which is by Psyche Williams Forson. Um, and that is about loads of the stuff we've just been talking about, about the fact that you cannot just go to people and tell them your diet's not healthy. You're going to have to cut out all of this stuff or whatever. Be really uh, shaming, completely disrespectful, present no viable alternatives and try and rest people from their their ways of eating that exist within families and cultures so that that book is really really interesting about all of that stuff and then like more broadly in food writing like i love everything that jonathan nunn does like i he is a, a extremely strange man and he has his idiosyncrasies but like he it comes through so clearly in these very specific dives he does into one food or one restaurant that he really just loves the food and loves the processes and the geographies and the people that have created the food. So that's another thing. But yeah, there are so many people. Jonathan Nunns has 
our age group in a chokehold. Like every time I meet up with one of my friends, it's like, oh, where should, where should we eat? It's like, oh, this is a Jonathan Nunn's recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and like, until I met him, I was like, is he even real? <laughs> He's real. Is He's he real. a like, collection of other consciousnesses which has been like pulled together? Just like lots and lots of smaller food writers in a big, big coat. <laughs> big coat, yeah. just like. I'm, I mean, as a, I wonder, is there an element in which every food writer has to have a little bit of monomania in them? You know, it's that like ruminating on food and the cutting out of the pictures. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, the way that you get good at anything is by kind of studying it kind of almost religiously for a long time, right? So the um, the sheer amount of energy that someone like me is expended on like looking at food packaging, for instance, is shocking. I mean, what I've really got to show for it, I'm not sure, but like I feel like there's a lot inside me that kind of is excited and, and galvanized by that stuff. So it's a starting point, I think. It's that thing of the way in which um, excitement and anxiety are cousins and yes. you sometimes never know which one you're feeling. Yeah. I mean, I remember watching your series of um, Bake Off, which I used to watch because it made me feel relaxed. And then I watched your series and I was like, oh, this girl looks stressed. Fucking stressed. <laughs> Why did she do it? <laughs> because I think I've always... I, I I was learning how to bake and I was like, this is a great way to get better at baking by just like doing this. I know it doesn't make any sense. I can't try and explain it after the fact. <laughs> it's just like, that was my thought process at the time. But I think I've also had within me like a huge part of me that wants to retreat from the world and never be seen and just like flog myself privately. And then a huge part of me that's like really... um ambitious in a way that is sometimes reckless and uh, even yeah it those two things coexist and I think that side of stuff kind of took over me when I did the application and then in the you know eight ten years since that side of things has had a chance to really get stuck in <laughs> I mean I always describe it as having um, two horses running in different directions yes and um, one is like a kamikaze level of self-confidence and it makes me want exactly. to be like fuck you Piers Morgan and I'll take you on and yeah. I'll find where you live and then the other is the pit of self-loathing that I yeah. carry everywhere yeah and as long as they're both running at equal speed with <laughs> equal force then I'm a balanced person okay yeah so it's like it is a balance predicated on like huge huge chaos oh yeah yeah okay I, was, I think that's fine I completely get that that's me I mean what's it what's it like to um, end up being a, a poster child for other people's values around food because of course you've got your own personal relationship with it and then you become a totem mm. for other people's yeah I mean that's my fault really <laughs> it is it is because like I like when I got I only got into the into food writing off the back of Bake Off and I didn't have a clue what I was saying I didn't know what I was doing I was kind of making it up as I went along in the last four years or so I feel like I'm starting to reach a maturity with like oh this is what my actual opinion is on this this is how I feel about that but up to that point everything I've thrown out there is just like stuck to Twitter stuck to the internet and so yeah it, it is very much my fault if people have this idea about me that doesn't really correspond to who I am now I guess. I mean, is it your fault or are we all doing it to greater and lesser extents? Like if you're a social media user, you're just flinging out kind of gobbits of your personality and seeing yeah. if they stick against the wall of other people's perception. I guess we are. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Um, yeah, I guess it's not that different to anyone else's experience in that in that sense. Um, I, I really I hear what you're saying about the non-judgment and the way in which judgments around food can be a vehicle for actually what you're making is a class judgment mm. or it's a racial judgment or it's a judgment yeah. about sophistication and worldliness or it's a judgment about, you know, are you a slapdash and unmindful person or are you someone who's interested yeah. in, you know, terroir and stuff. But the bedrock of cheap food is cheap labor yeah. and cheap life, whether human or animal. Yeah. So how can food writers begin to open up a space for exploration, examination, political challenge without it being a judgment on the people who eat those foods? I think just by being, I think it's really important that this does happen. I think it is already happening. It's happening in lots of places. I can think of lots of people who are doing this. 
um, I think the the crucial thing is about doing it with an eye for actually labor and really focusing on the fact that it has nothing to do with the food in question. Like obviously it's to do with the price point of the food. It's to do with the, the systems that deliver that food to your door. But like if we're talking about, um, for example, like workers producing ready meals, this was a real thing recently, right? Work workers producing ready meals and about how the labor conditions are terrible for them. It really has nothing to do with whether the ready meal is tastes nice or not, or like how many portions of your five a day it has in it, right? It's to do with how is this factory set up? Who is working in it? Why is this food price so low and these people being paid so low and all, all of this stuff? So, you know, if we can just like keep the value judgments out of the fact that it is a ready meal, then we can focus on actually making it better for everyone at every point in the in the chain. I mean, is there going to be some straight choices, which is, you know, nothing ethically produced is going to cost three pounds. And that's, of course, really difficult if you've only got three pounds. Or does it mean actually going, hang on, profit doesn't belong anywhere in food. Um, and the extraction of profit by an ownership class is what makes us have to make such choices. I mean, it's it's hard. Like, obviously, I don't know how this would work, like, on a big scale. But, like, I do know already, as things sound, like, some things are straightforward. Like, cheap food, let's say a cheap ready meal, means that at some point along that chain, someone hasn't been paid enough to live well. So, that's straightforward. But I think we get from this, this misguided idea that, therefore, any food that is expensive must be ethical in that sense. I know that's not fucking true. I've seen restaurant kitchens, like, something can be priced so high and so much of the money from that thing will go towards everything except the kitchen porter, everything except like, you know, toilets with soap in them. Do you know what I mean? So like, it's not enough to just be like, things have to be expensive because you never know where that money is going to be absorbed into and what nefarious ends it's going to be put towards like, some property developer in the West End or something like there's always got to be a closer interrogation than that. I mean, um, it was the amazing uh, Lewis Bassett essay, which was fuck fine dining. And mm. it really also chimed with other friends of mine who've worked in restaurant kitchens who are like, there is this hyper macho barbarian gladiatorial space and it doesn't have to be that way mm -hmm. um do you think that there is something about you know the gendering of food writing where it seems that women always focus on cooking in domestic context and men do this sort of chefy knifey stabby flamey stuff um because that's the only way in which it's socially acceptable to be a, a man with an interest in feeding people yeah, I think there is, I think there is a lot of that. I think obviously there is a lot of toxic shit that goes down in kitchens and a huge amount of that has to do with masculinity. I think also though, we, we've got to this weird crossroads with this stuff. And let me say, like, I have worked recently in several different food places, but like, I am not a restaurant, like a long time, like restaurant crew person. Like, so I, I can't speak from like, having decades in the industry industry or anything like that. But it seems like there's been a shift towards like a slightly different toxic energy in some places, at least towards like kitchen family, like we're all a family, which people have said this before, but like it kind of creates a cover under which you can hide all kinds of evil, um, whether that's wages, whether that's the treatment of people in the workplace, sexual harassment, all of this stuff. So there is macho stuff in there, but it's also not as explicitly gendered always, I think, as maybe it once was, but that doesn't mean it's less toxic. I mean, is there a way to have a food industry which is based on one group of people serving another group of people, which isn't inherently hierarchical, has a power dynamic, as are extractive or explosive? We're not going to get onto the Twitter what restaurants I should be cancelled I don't know what debate. you're talking about. I <laughs> I want nothing to do with it. You don't want anything to do with the Polish I, restaurants discourse. I thought it was an interesting provocation. It, yeah, I mean, the, the, a provocation is exactly what it was, right? Um, 
I mean, I don't think that we should abolish restaurants any more than we should abolish like home cooking. I think there's always a place for different ways of eating. And I feel like this has happened. The restaurant is a reasonably new invention, so to speak, like, but people have always found ways to eat outside of the house to eat food that other people have cooked and whatever they traded for that, you know, it, it has existed for a long, long time. So it will exist in some form. I don't think it has to be as bad, like kind of ethically as it currently is, but um, I just, I'm so tired of discourse. <laughs> I'm just so tired. I think that, you know, man cannot live on discourse alone, but for me, it's the spice of, <laughs> of like my information diet. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose there's the two ways of looking, right, at, at the act of, of cooking. And one is that it's a position of subordination and the other is that it's a, sub- a position of like total control. Mm. And I think maybe I first like encountered the latter when I went to uni and suddenly I was in a space which in terms of social class was totally different from what I'd grown up around. Yeah. And I was encountering these like very, very thin English literature girls who oh, didn't English eat English literature themselves. is always the worst department. I know, but I know that was my department. Sorry. And, you know, they were like very thin. Yeah. And <laughs> what seemed to always be cooking for other people and never eating. Yeah. And I was just a bit like, I don't understand this like this character or yeah. this performance of gender that you're doing which involves cooking but never eating yes like yeah. have you encountered it on your i mean i i did for a while art history at university so like yes i've encountered it <laughs> like i've been it i've lived it like i am that bitch in some respects not so much anymore but yeah i think that um when you cook for someone obviously as a food writer you like to linger on like the beautiful stuff I am a romantic at heart. I love to kind of think back in time. I like to think of situations that might happen in the future and think about all the ways that cooking might be like beautiful and revelatory. But I also know that it's a tool for spite. It's a tool for control. It is like a wonderful means through which to exercise like my more Machiavellian tendencies. So like it can be that, right? It can be that. And, um, is extremely difficult to navigate that terrain, especially at university. And when you say it's a it's a way of of um, or that cooking can be a vehicle for spite. I mean, what does that mean? Is that a sort of way of making people feel like they're in your debt somehow? Or? I mean, sometimes sometimes we do this consciously, but I think a lot of the time it operates like just beneath the surface. Like if you were forced to interrogate it by like a friend who knows you well, you'd be like, yeah, I'll be honest. I wanted to make that person a little bit uncomfortable. Like if you had someone coming around to, um, was a terrible food snob, can't you imagine that you would like provoke them like very slightly? Like you're not going to give them six radicchio leaves on a plate with like a dressing. You're going to give them something that might kind of bring them out of themselves a bit, like a little a sprinkling of something, a little discourse. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the um, the time I really had to confront my own monomania was um, my partner's family were coming over after Christmas and I spent two days cooking and he was like, why are you doing this? And I was like, I want to do this to show them that I'm somebody in control yes. and that I'm generous and fun. <laughs> <laughs> and he was That's just like, it. Yeah, you come across as really fun right yeah. now. Like the whole time. That's always me. Just I, I, I've given too much. Well, not given too much. Like I, I've spent too much energy that seems to have disappeared into the ether. And what people are left with is a burnt out husk and a plate and a plate of food that doesn't taste nice anymore because <laughs> there's such a bad energy in the room. This is why I don't really like cooking for people a lot of the time. Or it's when. Obviously, you want the opportunity to be a gracious host, which you can't do if people don't compliment you enough. (laughs) See, I don't like too many compliments because then I feel, I feel that I'm being placated and then that only makes me cross. Oh no. (laughs) So you can't win with me. I'll admit that there's no winning. I I want the opportunity to magnanimously turn away the compliment. (laughs) That's what I want. And if you don't give it to me, (laughs) then I'm just sitting there being like, it's fine. I'll do the washing up now. (laughs) <laughs> like and crawl off back into the kitchen see this is exactly what i meant when i said that cooking for people is like just not always the gift that we would like to think it is i mean is there such thing as a gift at all well i don't know maybe, maybe not. that's a topic for like <laughs> another show i mean maybe just moving on um 
a little bit. Um, why? Why is the food world so mm. stacked with wrongins? Is it because stacked. that's okay. what work is like and that's what media is like? Or is there something specific about the food world which means that Giles Corrin can have a job? Hmm. See, I, I, don't, I can't compare it to other things because I frankly pay absolutely no attention to anything that's not food related. So I really don't have a clue if all arms of media are as bad as this. But within food media, I think that maybe there's something quite British about the way that we have got to where we're at. I think there is this desperate need to prove that, um, to like kind of perform eating and to also perform having a lot of money to eat a very expensive thing. So in the case of restaurant criticism, like as it has been for a reasonably long time, to perform it, but also to undermine the act. It's like you're doing this thing that should be something that is a source of, you know, sometimes great joy, but always great care or great discernment. I know there's love there, but they have to kind of tear it down. It's like it's too vulnerable to admit that you really care. So you have to have this attempt at comedy instead, which is how you get people like Giles Curran saying that Peckham is stabby or whatever it is that they decide they want to say in that moment. I think it's partly a defense. I think obviously it's partly just classism, racism, all the usual culprits. I think often they are just quite immature people performing extremely, extremely hard. But there must be something. Like they must have made little collages at some point of like, you know, the Fortnum and Mason catalogue or something. <laughs> like there, there must have been something to start with, but where the love went, I'm not sure. But maybe it wasn't the food that they loved. Maybe it was the opportunity to pass judgment on the work of others. That's true. Maybe I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt too much to even assume that that would be a guiding motivation. Yeah. You're like, oh, you were Anakin Skywalker once. Like, <laughs> you know, there was goodness in you. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I just, I just can't understand how, I mean, people do this, so it shouldn't surprise me at this point, given the way the country is, but... I cannot believe that people can get out of bed in the morning with no integrity in their soul and no like real joy, but people do. I'm perpetually disappointed by that, perpetually. And I'll yeah. be raging about something. I'll be like, oh, how could you do this if you cared about your job and you cared about the values? Yeah. Like, how could you do this? And then you know, my friends will be like, why are you always disappointed? Like, why yeah. did you always have faith in people? Yeah. I'm like, because that's how I was raised. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, the, the big economic backdrop to this conversation is a cost of living mm. crisis in which every consumer choice people make from the tiny to the big yeah. is just fraught with so much precarity. Is it, you know, crazy or offensive to keep talking about pleasure within that context when so many are talking about necessity or is there a kind of way to make room for pleasure where the backdrop is one of you know extreme financial vulnerability i think i think people will always return to pleasure i think that is the the thing that guides so much of our cultural output and i don't think that's going to change like it doesn't mean that we don't also talk about pain and it doesn't mean we don't talk about the tangible ways that, that we can survive or even make things better, but that there is always going to be pleasure. I think, I can't remember if this is something that he's written about at length or whether he just talks about it all the time, but I think that Jonathan has written something about the sandwich as something that emerges out of conditions of scarcity when there's kind of not much food to go around. You have to kind of bulk it out with bread. You have to sell it cheap. You have to sell it kind of in an incidental kind of way it's something that emerges from scarcity and it's it's best it's most pleasurable when it still kind of carries the echo of that and so that's why sometimes a sandwich that just has like far 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 too much going on loses the pleasure in that so i think that even when we have to make sacrifices in our diet sometimes it's surprising the places that pleasure comes through amidst all of the trouble. 
I think that seems like a really nice place to wind up before I come back with like, and more stress, anxiety, and neurosis. <laughs> um, Ruby Tando, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much.